world in 1750 was composed of many diverse human communities. Empires stretched across vast regions of the world. Some of these empires dated back quite a long time. In Afro-Eurasia, the Ottoman Empire's conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean began as early as the 13th century. Russian expansion in Central Asia went back 300 years. Mughal rule over South Asia dated back about 200 years. The Qin Dynasty ruled China and parts of Central Asia for a century. Similarly, some of the Spanish and Portuguese colonies in the Atlantic and the Americas can be traced back two or three centuries. At the same time, the British, French, and Dutch overseas empires were somewhat newer. But lots of people didn't live in empires. Many lived in smaller, centralized states, mostly kingdoms of some sort, a form of government that dated back as much as 5,000 years. Others lived in even older types of organizations, small societies where all politics were local. These societies were led by councils or chiefs, connected by family or a shared sense of place, or in confederation of villages, loosely connected to each other. Of course, this didn't mean that their forms of community weren't changing or evolving, just that local conditions led to smaller, less centralized governance. The small size of these communities also doesn't mean that these people had no sense of community outside their local neighborhood or village. Many people sensed that they shared a language or a culture with people who didn't live in the same political unit as they did. Even more, people felt a sense of community with others who shared their religion even far away. And many of their religions were very old indeed. Islam had existed for a millennium at this point. 18th century Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, and Judaism were evolved from even older religious communities. One thing most people shared in common, whether they lived in a small community or a large empire, was an understanding that they were somebody's subjects. They shared a sense of not really having much political authority or standing of their own. Rather, they owed their allegiance to a chief or prince or ruler of some sort who had the right, or at least the power, to make decisions for them. But that was about to change. In the long 19th century, the era between 1750 and 1914, new ideas were emerging. Individual sovereignty, the conviction that a person has the right to control their own body and choices. National sovereignty, the idea that people together have the right to make political decisions and exercise leadership. And nationalism, the belief that people governing themselves have the right to a homeland. So people created a new form of community called the nation state. The nation state is a state, a legal unit and a piece of territory that coincides with a nation, a self-governing group of people. This change was a big deal, as you will see in this unit, but we have to analyze it a bit. In the first place, some people before 1750 had experimented with ideas that sounded something like sovereignty and something like governments that had elements of the nation state. Also, after 1750, Things changed gradually, even where big revolutions created the first new nation states, like in Haiti, France, and the Americas. Finally, the long 19th century was also an era of empires, as we will discuss later. And empires were almost the opposite of the nation state. Nevertheless, these new nation states represented maybe the most important changes in the community's frame in hundreds of years. New technologies developed to support larger and larger states. Better methods of organization and communication extended the reach of the state. And new military technology made government stronger than local warlords or nobles. With these new advantages, the nation state dominated other forms of political organization. They came to cover just about the whole world. For better or worse, we live in a world of nation states even today.